All right, thanks, Ruth. Recording is in progress. Um, welcome to our UN SDG working group, uh, where we're attempting to figure out how to better measure uh, open source software as having an impact uh, on the, the SDGs. Um, I am happy to invite, we're going to have, I think, I don't see Michael on. Um, he was going to do a uh, recap of the DPG Alliance annual meeting that he attended. Um, but um, the, and we'll start with um, Shaliza Mile and Vashika Batodia, um, who are from Samagra. And um, they have done a really cool product called DPG Score that they're going to talk to us about. Um, I think it's a survey that, that they got a lot of really interesting feedback. And I think it applies nicely to a lot of the work that we're trying to do of how do you measure if these projects are healthy, if they're contributing to the SDGs, um, and we can probably learn from them. I know I talked to Shaliza and, and learned a lot. I was very confused about digital public goods versus digital public infrastructure. I think I'm still confused about that, <laughs> but maybe... Maybe then the second time around, I'll, I'll get more clear. Um, anyway, take it away, Shaliza and Bashika. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, David. I'll I'll pass it on to my colleague, Vanchika, to walk us through, give us some context about what we do, and then walk us through some key insights from the report. And then we can also go into more details uh, uh, in the report itself. Sure. Um, thanks, Shelza. I'll just share my screen as well. Um, is my screen visible? Not yet. Okay. Um, I, for some reason, I'm not able to share my screen. Um, I just gave you co-host access. Maybe you can try again. You no, can I also think... share the presentation with me, Manchika. I'll share it in a, yeah. Just yeah, yeah, Just yeah. the presentation with you. Yeah, Shelza, maybe you can present your screen if it's working. Yeah, I'm just downloading. Shelza, are you able to? Yeah, I'm. I'm able to share my screen. Okay, I see. Can you can you uh, see my screen? Yeah, we can. Okay, okay, great. Okay, over to you, Vanshika. All right. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Vanshika, and um, I'll be talking about what we do at Code for GovTech here. I basically work um, as an associate consultant with Samagra, and Samagra is an um, impact consulting firm that's based out of India, where we work with various state governments and the central government across systemic transformation projects. And one of the initiatives that Samagra is currently implementing is the Code for GovTech initiative. So um, before we actually get into what we do at Code for GovTech, I um, just want to take a moment and uh, first discuss about, you know, um, how has DPGs and DPS really evolved in the last few years? So um, as we all know, uh, the sustainable development goals have the potential to address some of the world's most challenging issues, be it, you know, eradicating poverty or um, combating climate change. And one of the most exciting developments in this journey has been the rise of digital public goods or DPGs as we call it, which is basically um, anything that's in open source software, data, AI models, or even content or other digital resources that play a very critical role in advancing these um, sustainable development goals. And DPGs, when they're 
um, often um, used in conjunction with other tech building uh, blocks, they basically form a digital public infrastructure. So um, in the last few years, DPGs have been a real game changer. And since because they are open source, so they also provide uh, these uh, solutions that are scalable and can be applied and adopted all through the uh, world, be it different regions, different countries and different states. But um, there has been a lot of growth and momentum that has been happening in the DPG and DPI ecosystem. But even after that, there are still some challenges that remain. Uh, so majority of these products um, that are being built, they are either funded by the government or through philanthropic organizations. And uh, because of that, uh, there is uh, always a lack of resources when it comes to building these products. And since uh, since they're uh, supported by philanthropies or go uh, government organizations, there's also um, a question of sustainability that always remains. And um, on the other hand, we have observed that, you know, um, in the developer community in general, uh, there are a lot of students, working professionals, or anybody who's a tech enthusiast, uh, they're interested in contributing to open source and also willing to contribute to these digital public goods, but they don't have the required uh, knowledge or resources um, when it comes to them making contributions uh, to these DPGs and DPIs. And that's when we realized that there is a strong need for um, a community around DPGs and DPIs that could help us to solve um, these challenges that exist. And this is how um, we started the Code for GovTech initiative back in 2022. And our main goal um, behind uh, the Code for GovTech initiative is to build um, an active open source community around uh, DPGs. And we want to strengthen and exist, uh, extend the current communities that these organizations have already around their products. And in the process of doing that, we want to ensure that the entire collaboration that is happening um, between these organizations and the contributor community that happens in a, in a very frictionless manner and the value proposition that are there for both these groups, which is basically organizations and contributors, those are very clearly defined. So this is broadly what we are trying to do at Code for GovTech. And um, how do we ensure that uh, this goal is getting achieved is through uh, four, uh, four primary interventions that we follow. First is, uh, so over the last uh, 2.5 years, we have really structured and codified the entire collaboration process that happens between the organizations and the contributors. So on the organization's front, um, we want to ensure uh, that, you know, there, there are basically four steps that we want to ensure that every organization who's participating in the community, they are following those four steps. First is basically assessing the contribution readiness um, around their products when it comes to them getting contributions on those uh, products, because not every product is at a level that can attract contributions from the community. So first that is done. Um, and if the organizations feel that their um, product is not at a level where they can attract contributions, that involves them putting in certain enablers in place so that uh, the entire process, um, you know, follows smoothly. Once that is done, they scope and list the projects in the community. They mentor those projects. And once the project has been closed, they um, facilitate the incentives also to the contributors who have been working on those projects. Coming to the contributor side, so our entire community is um, based on Discord and GitHub. So as soon as a contributor joins our Discord channel, um, he or she gets onboarded in the community and they explore the entire ecosystem and the different projects that we have for them in the community. Uh, once they select the, uh, uh, the project that interests them, they start contributing to that project. In the meanwhile, they also receive mentorship from the organizations. And once uh, they have successfully contributed, they uh, get access to the other rewards and um, you know other employment opportunities that are being promised by these organizations. So in this way, we ensure that uh, the collaboration that's happening between the organization and the contributors is really smooth. And also to ensure that we are able to sustain our momentum when it comes to scaling our community and spreading awareness about the same, there are different community constructs that we have in um, place. So to ensure that uh, the entire community that we are building, it's a um, community-led initiative, we have community managers in place, which 
um, basically help uh, organizations to build communities around their products. So they help organizations in scoping out projects, listing those in the community and also getting mentors to uh, contributors to work on those projects. Similarly, to ensure that we are able to reach out to people who are genuinely interested in contributing to DPGs and DPIs, we have um, campus leaders in place. Uh, so we currently have a group of uh, 30 campus leaders across different universities in India who are basically acting as ambassadors of Code for GovTech in their own campuses. And um, next up, as I mentioned earlier, that a lot of these organizations don't really have the required resources when it comes to providing mentorship to the contributors. We also have um, a, a concept in place called Angel Mentors, which is basically a group of volunteers who are from the community itself and they are interested in providing mentorship um, to the people who are working on these projects where the, where the organizations are not able to provide any mentorship support. So that is another construct that we have. And um, lastly, uh, since it's a community um, initiative, so we also realize that it's very important for us to have um, a physical place wherein people can interact with each other. And that also inculcates a sense of belonging to the community. So we also have city chapters um, in two different cities in India, Delhi and Bangalore, where people meet on a regular basis. Um, we have certain speakers who come up and talk about their own projects and products. And it's just a place for people to network with each other and learn from each other. So that's how we are able to ensure that we are able to you know, scale this community um, in a uniform manner. Um, next up, there are two different flagship initiatives um, that we run every year. First is the dedicated mentoring program, which is um, a three months long um, coding program where uh, selected organizations put forward their projects and uh, they open those projects for applications and a selected candidate is um, then um, asked to work on that project. So he or she gets the opportunity to receive mentorship from these organizations and also contribute to that project for a duration of three months, um, after which they also get a generous stipend. And um, upon that, we also conduct DPG Dialogues, which is basically uh, an annual conference um, where uh, different organizations and different uh, leaders from the ecosystem come together. They discuss certain challenges that are currently um, there in the ecosystem and also align on uh, the strategic direction going forward. So these um, flagship uh, flagship programs help us to ensure that we are able to maintain that annual spike that we get in our uh, community. And lastly, since it's a, a community initiative, so we also work on um, a lot of different uh, frameworks, knowledge assets, and uh, we also um, try to partner with a lot of global um, uh, ecosystem partners and different um, institutes so that we are able to sort of, um, you know, um, uh, get the support from the ecosystem. And uh, today we are basically here to present one of our knowledge assets that we have been working on um, since uh, the last uh, few months, which is uh, DPG score. Um, it's uh, an annual report that uh, we uh, launched this year and we will be working on it every year, which basically aims to provide an overview of the current status um, of different uh, DPG communities in India and uh, in India and abroad and also gather insights from these organizations and um, different contributors. So um, I'll now ask Shelza to maybe give you a walkthrough of uh, what the report aims to achieve and uh, the different insights that we have been able to sort of um, uh, collaborate, uh, to, uh, to sort of, um, you know, um, uh, that we have been able to see through the report. So over to you, Shelza. Thank you. Thank you, Anchika. Um, so hi, everyone. So as Vanshika explained, the different initiatives that we have been undertaking as part of the larger umbrella program, which is called Code for GovTech. One of the areas that we work a lot is creating mm -hmm. knowledge assets, trying to understand what is the current state of the community. And in that respect, there is this entire report that we uh, we we worked worked on this year. So this was the first time when we created this entire report, which is called the DPG score and the full form is state of the community report. It's not a research study. It's essentially a dipstick study of what's happening currently in the DPG ecosystem and what's the current state of the communities around these digital public goods. Uh, because as we all are aware that digital public goods are open source uh, softwares, open data, open content. 
and we all know that to essentially sustain open source projects in the long run a community a vibrant community is really important so we wanted to go a little bit more deep and understand what is currently happening uh, uh, to these communities and what is it that the what are the different strategies that the organizations are currently implementing and what are the challenges that they are facing so hence what we did uh, we uh, interview 25 organizations. So essentially, we work with around 52 organizations in our entire uh, program. So this is a glimpse of different organizations that we work with. Now, not all these organizations are DPGs. Some of them are um, open source projects. But what we essentially filter on are the projects that are leading to social impact. So for us, if an organization is building an open source product or a platform and that uh, and the predominant use case of that product and the platform is social impact, that is the organization that we would work with. So this is a glimpse of the 52 organizations that we work with. Uh, so we reached out to all the 52 organizations uh, to understand if they're interested in participating in this tipstick survey. And then we finally ended up interviewing 25 out of these organizations um yeah yeah david your hand is up hi yeah and a quick question um when you say they're not a dpg do you mean they're just not officially a dpg from the dpg alliance or do you mean um do you mean something else do you mean yeah they so wouldn't... it can be it can be it can be both so it can be either they are not a certified digital public good by the digital public good alliance or uh, maybe they might not also fulfill the standards that are in place for being a digital public good. Uh, but but most of the time, these are these are the organizations who have been working in the open source for a really long time. So they are following certain hygiene standards that are in place, which are also the standards that Digital Public Goods Alliance also follows. So most of the times, it's just that they they don't want to have that certificate. They are, they are happy with what they're doing. Uh, so they really don't want to sort of maybe approach or they're not even aware that, okay, they have to approach the alliance and you know get that certification so it can be either okay great thanks so we ended up uh talking to 25 organizations we did in-depth interviews with them we prepared like a questionnaire a tool to understand different aspects of community building and we also wanted to get a glimpse from the developers so what is it that the developers are looking into when they are contributing to products uh, when they are actively you know working on a product what are the different parameters that they look look at so we did both sides of survey and and then we ended up preparing uh, the report so there are some key insights that i would like to first uh, focus on and then maybe and we can share the link to the report so the report has a lot more insights and it goes into the details of different sub cohorts under the developers and the organizations as well um, so 42 percent of the contributors the developers uh, they reported that inadequate documentation and complex code base are the most common barriers that they face when they are trying to contribute to these projects uh, 64 percent contributors reported that there is an awareness gap uh, as one of the barriers that is preventing them from making contributions to such projects that are focusing on social impact. So they're not even aware that there is an opportunity out there for them where they can you know, contribute to such projects. 71% uh, of the contributors reported that skill development is the biggest motivator for them to contribute and financial incentive for them was amongst the lowest. So for us, this has always been uh, you know, an area of contention in the sense that because we also do paid program as part of the larger initiative and then we have some unpaid projects as well. So we have always been a little confused that, okay, do contributors, uh, are they looking for monetary incentives or what is it that they're really looking for? So once after we did the survey, we realized that most of them are looking more on skill development and learning more, building more skills. 60% uh, of the contributors said that they need weekly mentoring support. 
when they are working on these projects without that it is difficult for them to contribute hence they need some sort of support from the me from the organizations who are the builders and the maintainers of that project uh 52 percent of the organizations uh lack a community manager uh so that was a that was actually not a surprise but that's that's a big challenge that organizations want to build a community but uh, they don't have a community manager. Hence, that shows that maybe that is not a priority for them or maybe they don't have the resources to hire a separate community manager for this entire, uh, for building a community. So these were some of the key insights. Um, I'll also open the report and show you the other insights that are there. Uh, but what we predominantly wanted want to do year on year is this community snapshot which is essentially certain metrics that we defined and we said that these are these are some of the metrics of a healthy community and we want to do a dipstick every year to see what is the health of the community so this is the scorecard that we came up with so if you look at the different metrics here there are some input metrics some output metrics and then in the end there is this question around the perceived value of a community for the organization so in input metrics, we have things like, you know, whether they have a community manager, how frequently uh, do they participate in community meetups, events, uh, what's the average duration of an open issue or the pull request before they resolve it. So how actively are they resolving commits that are there on the, on the repository? Uh, how much mentoring support are they able to provide to the contributors? Uh, how big is their existing community? So these are the output metrics that how big is the community that they're currently running out of the community contributors? How many of them are actively contributing? Uh, on an average, how many new community contributors join uh, on a monthly basis? And then what percentage of your product's code base is contributed by a community? Uh, so these are some of the output metrics that we had and then you can see the number of organizations who are above a certain benchmark so this is the the scorecard that we finally then came up with i'll also quickly show you the report uh, can you all see the report screen or okay great so this is the report um, there are these are some of the uh, you know ecosystem folks that we kind of uh, uh, engage with so what do they have to say about the entire community building efforts? And then here you can see the, the methodology. Uh, then these are the key findings. So there's like an executive summary. And this is the overview of the sample. So what kind of organization? So you can see here that 56% of the organizations have products that are recognized by the Digital Public Goods Alliance. Uh, remaining are essentially organizations who don't have the DPG certification. Then 64% of these organizations were not for profit. So things like that, you know, what was the average tech team size of these organizations? So you'll find this, the, the, the sample details. And similarly, on the contributor side also, you'll find some of these details. And then uh, we also did some cohorting of different organizations. And here are the organization side insights. So community building requires sustained efforts. So we see, we actually saw a trend that people who are doing it for a really long time, organizations, they have been able to build a community. So it's not a short term thing. It's not like you can start today and you know, you'll, you'll have a community by the end of six months. So it is a long term journey. That's something that we could see a correlation here. Uh, then, you know, the organizations who are focusing on mentorship programs, community events and all that's a way to attract contributors. So similarly, you will see like a lot of insights in the report from the organization side. And then the second section is essentially insights from the contributors. So what do the contributors and the developers feel about the entire DPG community ecosystem? And then we have the community snapshot so this is the this is the scorecard that i was projecting earlier so you can find the details here of the entire uh, a glimpse of the entire community so i'll just pause here uh, if anybody wants to wants me to deep dive into a certain certain section of the report i'll be more than happy to do that 
Yeah, does anybody have any questions? I have one about, um, I'm curious, of, well, I have a bunch of questions. Well, one about, um, more about this. Have you broken out to see the impact that community managers have? Um, like, you know, the, 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 the projects that have a community manager, do they do much better in some of the categories than the ones that don't? Or, or is it not as much of a difference? Have you done that breakout? Uh, we don't have that data here right now, but we have done that correlation. So definitely organizations who have community managers have a better community in terms of number of contributors and also percentage, higher percentage of contributors being active and contributing to the code base. Uh, so definitely there is a very clear correlation between the two. Well, that could just be that when you get to a certain size, you absolutely need a community manager. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'd be Maybe curious that. to see if the like her contributor experience is improved dramatically or not. Yeah. yeah so, uh, so from our experience, because we work with multiple organizations and some of them have like a very dedicated uh, community manager, some of them don't. So from an, from our experience, we can say, and we also work with the contributors, right? So we know that if there is like a dedicated person who is actively uh, prioritizing the experience of the contributors, there the con contributors have a very good experience. Whereas uh, places where, where we are directly in touch with the tech team, uh, there we have to uh, you know be after the tech team to tell them okay please you know you look at this this PR that has been raised by a contributor and can you please review that PR uh, because the tech team already has a lot of work so for them it becomes like an additional activity so we we also face a challenge when there is no community manager from the organization yeah I really I really like that I mean as somebody who is who is technical and has worked with a lot of technical people, it, it makes a lot of sense to me <laughs> that, um, and I think it's a great opportunity to bring people that aren't necessarily technical focused into the community, these communities and the value that they can bring. Um, I think yeah. that's, that's great. Um, so we're still forming our mission, um, but you know, we, we want to make it easier for, people, I think of that awareness gap particularly reg reg resonated with me. We want to make it easier for um, users, contributors to find projects that are addressing various SDGs. Do you have thoughts on what would be useful there? I was, I found it interesting that the, some projects don't want to be certified by the DBG Alliance. Um, so yeah. maybe we could create standards that would be really easy that would still enable some kind of a github api search so you could identify them yeah. but they wouldn't you know enforce the the additional standards that the dpg alliance um has mm. um anyway do you have any thoughts on like so uh, definitely i think if there is a repository where a contributor a repository which is contributor friendly so currently the challenge that we see with the uh, digital public goods uh, registry that they have that is not a that is not a developer friendly or a contributor friendly registry so for me to go as a contributor to choose which project to contribute towards or to easily you know filter and understand what's the kind of impact that the project is ha having that is not available right now in the in the DPG Alliance registry as well. So if there is a registry where I can actually go and you know look at the maturity level of a project, then I can also look at the impact that the project has. Then it will be very easy for me as a contributor to filter and also make myself aware, uh, 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 generate that awareness for myself to be able to take a more informed decision. Uh, because that's the role currently that we are playing. So when we go to different campuses, colleges, or, you know, maybe different existing tech communities, and when we talk about these projects, we are providing them with that information that, okay, so-and-so project has so much impact, and then they're really excited. Contributors are very interested and excited. They, they are looking for such opportunities, just that they don't know where to start from. So hence, that kind of a mapping and a repository would definitely help. Do you already have some kind of metrics then that you're using to measure those impacts? 
uh impact in the sense the impact of the project yeah so we don't have a very very uh strict metric so we essentially tell the organizations to talk about uh the sector for first of all that they are working in and the kind of uh, uh, uh the kind of impact in terms of the number of people that they have impacted or the number of active users that are using the product and what's the end social impact there uh, so it could simply be a survey collection tool, but if that survey collection tool is being used by, you know, some millions of users who are then, you know, working in, for example, the healthcare domain to collect very important data points, then that is what they want to know. Uh, so they want to know the end social act outcome that the the project is trying to solve for even if it is not like a direct impact it's an indirect impact still that is what uh, really helps people to relate to a project are you already working that sounds great um are you already working with chaos um in the in the fact that they you know are coming up with a lot of health metrics for projects we are actually not we wanted to we were in touch with divya for that but we are not actively we have not tried to combine uh, the metrics that we follow and the metrics that they have are you open to that or is there yeah, some we be we would be open to that definitely okay. yeah okay and in fact if if you all are also thinking of such standards and such metrics or you want to create like a uh, a repository you know of uh, these projects so we would be more than happy to you know uh, uh, sort of aligned to the uh, the standards that you come up with for the organizations that we work with. So we'll be more than happy to do that. As long as it helps in increasing discoverability, uh, that would be great. Okay, fantastic. So discoverability awareness is like your main focus? Yeah, yeah. From, from the organizations, from the contributors' perspective, yes. And once the contributors discover a project then have them getting a smooth experience that's sort of the second second layer for us okay great um does anybody else have any other questions i don't want to hog the, the limelight ah whoever raised your hand go ahead that's ruth um thank you um and shika and shaliza i think we have interacted over email and yeah. Call. yeah yeah i think my question is around like retention um contributor retention in this um communities that you work with how have you um like for example i know the food for golf deck program is there a way you have like kind of uh, measured that like how many contributors after the um Programs stay back. Um, how do they, how are these contributors faring over this period of time that the program has been running? Um, you know, feedback from. Yeah, so uh, so we've been running this program since the last two and a half years now. Uh, so we have around uh two fifty contributors who have actively uh closed a project. So by closed I mean like they have fulfilled the requirements of the project that they were contributing to um, and uh, so that's that is 250 is that number so we call them as super contributors we call them as you know uh, the most active contributors uh, but uh, if we look at a larger funnel so we have around 21,000 interested contributors on our discord so we see that a lot of people join the discord but then there is like a, a steep jump. So from 25,000, we have around 4,000 who are engaged in the community. So by engaged, I mean like they would go, you know, and comment on the ticket. They would link their Discord ID with GitHub, which is the basic requirement for them to start contributing as per our tech platform. So some of the other action. Uh, so from 25, 21,000, there's like a huge drop to 4,000. And then from 4,000, we have like around 200 odd people who are actually contributing to the projects. And we have also, also realized that there is a retention once 
once the contributor contributes once and they have a good experience with the organization, they usually keep on continuing with them uh, because then the organization also knows that, okay, this contributor understands my code base and, you know, they are a good uh, fit uh, for me if I have any open projects that somebody can work on. So so that's something that we have seen with, with a few of our contributors over the years. Hey, um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Like, do you like, um, do you encourage the organizations to also take note of this, um, this growth of contributors in their community as well? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So organizations, uh, the reason why they are engaging with us is also because they want to grow their community. Uh, so hence, uh, they they do take a note of that if they have like more people working with them. So they are pretty like satisfied with that. For some organizations, I would be honest there, the idea is that, okay, this is an open project and we want somebody to come in and, you know, do this for us. So that's like a quick resource gap that they're trying to uh, fill and not necessarily, you know, trying to build a community. Uh, but I would say around 50-60% of the organizations, they are trying to build a community and they're trying to like retain the people who are actively contributing. Right. In fact, organizations are also very happy to, you know, provide certificates and, you know, letter of recommendations because that's what young developers are also looking at. Um, so that's something that they are very open uh, to providing uh, to the contributors who are active. Hmm. Okay. Um. Thank you for sharing. I like David said. Um. This group is open as well. We, um. Will you know? You could jump in. I think someone from your team has been watching one of our meetings earlier. So. Yeah. Yeah. Part from our team had joined the last. Uh. Last to last meeting. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the presentation once again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ruth. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I yeah, I think there's uh, a lot of you could help us a lot with helping us um, scope our our metrics and our standards. Um, I think you have a really good knowledge and understanding of both the contributor need and the maintainer need. And and one thing we're very concerned about is we don't want to burden maintainers, um, mm. and we want to like enable standards that are meaningful for discovery. Um, so that the the overall, I think, action from the UN um, in the conference last summer, which spawned this working group, was um, how can we, we know open source projects are um, impacting or addressing the, the UN SDGs. How do we measure it? How do we, like, identify it? Um, so I think there's, that's where we want to focus our work, and it's really in that discovery space. And so, yeah. Um, yeah, maybe we can keep you informed of our ideas and you can say, whoa, don't do that. That's a horrible idea. Everyone's going to, you know, get upset or, you know, that sounds reasonable because the last thing we want to do is burden, burden all the maintainers and have an uproar. Um, but at the so same time, yeah. at the same time, I think there's I, the, the GitHub universe report just came out and I think it said there's 25 million publicly available repos. Oh, um, wow. And, you know, DPG Alliance, I think, has just under 200 digital public hmm. goods. So yeah. I'm like, I'm like the scene, like, I, I know a lot of those, a lot of those, I mean, there's a lot more private repos too, like, I think hundreds mm -hmm. of millions. So, I will, and some of the public ones are, you know, just a student project or something that isn't doesn't have a yeah. community around it but i gotta think that there's a lot more out there that is just not not being flagged you know because there's no mechanism right now besides the dpg alliance um yeah. and so yeah we just want to enable that um yeah. process yeah. of flagging yourself yeah. or having a community manager or even having an outside entity come in and say hey i know about this project they don't know about dpg alliance you know, hmm. I can help them either become a DPG, you know, a, a digital public good and fill out the paperwork for them, you know, 
make yeah. sure that they want to. But I don't think that's work that a maintainer would have to do. It could be something a non-technical person could do. Um, mm. Or maybe we find a new a new process of not that entire, you know, process, but something just really narrow. Um, and I kind of like the idea of starting small. Like maybe you just pick the SDG that you think you are impacting, mm. you know, making that that's your like focus area. Um, yeah. And then yeah. and then maybe you go a level down and figure you know figure out which targets um, you know you're uh, you're addressing you know mm. the, the the dot the fourteen dot one or dot two or you know get get into a little more of the deeds and then maybe you put more of a justification as like a next level um, but there's all kinds of different things that we we're going to think about um, I wanted yeah. to I just wanted to announce. Um, I invited Layla um, from our George Washington Upward Bound program. Um, hi, Layla. Thanks so much for joining. So Layla is in high school and she's, I got to talk to her a few weeks ago and she's trying to figure out like what she wants to do with her life. And she's, I knew, I did not know what I wanted to do when I was in high school. And she's like, I want to yeah. do cybersecurity and, 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 and international affairs. <laughs> <laughs> I was blown it's away. too early to decide <laughs> high school is too early <laughs> yeah well she, I mean you got to pick your colleges and things like that so um I said well you know if you want to want to get experience with some cyber infrastructure discussion points and international affairs jump on this call you know that <laughs> so Layla thanks for joining I hope you uh, enjoyed some of it um yeah um do you have any thoughts do you have any questions for that um thank you for having me um i just think it's really interesting to see like the work that you're doing i don't think i have any questions at the moment but um it's really interesting to see like the whole like framework and all the like um all the work behind it so yeah thank you <laughs> awesome awesome yeah thanks for joining us that's that's really cool that you are um jumping in and trying to learn all the different things I think your future is very bright. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, I'm sorry. We just kind of like, well, it's a good thing um, Michael was going to present on the GPG Alliance report, but he 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 was not able to make it to this meeting. Um, I put in the um, chat our GitHub repo. So I just started like adding the initial readme, but that is open for anybody. I'm going to move over our um our initial actions um and and some of the the stuff that we had put on a, a, a google docs form so that we can really start honing in on our scope um and and really you know get some better ideas um ideally what i would like is for us to start different people um who are inspired by this work um figure out you know the areas that they think that they could really contribute um, and we'll start like defining specific work that we can accomplish with the goal of presenting that work at the the next UN Ospos for Good conference, um, which I don't know. I haven't seen any emails about it, but the last ones were in July. So that would be like the target of six, seven months from now. Um, yeah, Layla, feel free to continue, you know, to, to join our our meetings um you're welcome um and everybody is welcome to contribute and and add uh let me know ruth and i are maintainers and, and we're the co-leads of this group um so so let us know if you if you have any questions or troubles um you know contributing um any other anybody else have any questions sorry for hogging the, the mic nope. once all right. Thank you so much, Shaliza and Majika. And to people that celebrate the various holidays that are coming up, happy holidays. And I really appreciate everybody's time. Our next meeting is not until January. I don't remember exactly when. Um, somewhere the second or third week of January, I think. All right. Take care, everybody. Thanks Thank again. you. Happy holidays. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye